I'm Keith Gosland. I'm Ann Charles. I'm Linda Quinlan. It is Tuesday, January 29th, and welcome to All Things LGBTQ. And this time we really are back again. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about Beto Sanchez Perez and migrant justice and things to which we may not have been attentive, but <coughs> we should be in the future. There was a Judiciary Committee hearing on fair and impartial policing. We're going to talk a bit about that, and it will reflect back with the migrant justice. Legislature's back. H3, about ethnic and social studies standards bill, should have gone through the House Education Committee today with some final revisions on language. We'll talk some about that. And the budget appropriation should have been approved, should go to the floor tomorrow. Uh, we're also going to talk a, a little bit about minimum wage. And as you're watching ORCA, look for the House Human Services Committee discussion on preserving the right to abortion. Ah. Could be enlightening. And then a little talk about a CDC report that came out about transgender house, high school students, hospital students. Uh, federal administration, they're proposing a rule change to Medicare D that will change the requirement for inclusion in drug classifications and what this means for people with HIV and AIDS is they may no longer have access to retroviral treatment. Mm. Duh. Events coming up. What Ann has brought us is Every February for the past two years, JAG Productions has invited African-American theater artists to spend a week in White River Junction, and they will be doing performances starting on Friday, February 8th, when they will be doing the play, The Last Day of Black History Month, a conversation with a naked black southern lesbian. I'll be waiting for photographs. Well, and they're going to produce these staged readings. It's $20 per ticket. Um, but if you go to all four readings, I get a discount. It's fifty dollars. Okay. And that, just if I may, also, the um, wrinkle is she's you, on a roll. It says there's no way on the website. You, know, you if you want to get the fifty dollar deal, which Lynn and I did, you have to, you know, say you're going to go for each show for twenty dollars, and then magically, the price changes to twelve fifty. So it's a little wrinkle. If you have trouble, call them. But don't be discouraged. It should and be great. I'm very excited about it. As if by lesbian magic. Yes. So yeah. other events. Uh, Monday, February 11, 6 p.m. at the Montpelier Senior Center. You might have heard about Stonewall having a 50th anniversary, and perhaps people are trying to organize an event here in Vermont. Pride Center, actually, by the time this airs, this event will have occurred. It's on Friday from 3 to 5.30. Needs and assessments of older LGBTQ Vermonters. Ann and Linda are going. I'm mentioning it because we're going to want to hear from them on the next show what was discussed. Um, a mention for the Pride Center that every Wednesday from 4.30 to 5.30, they have their peer support group for LGBTQ people living with disabilities. And it's one of the things that we just don't promote enough. Um, Morrisville at their community center, Monday, February 11th, is their transgender support group, and then it meets every two weeks. Fundraisers, Saturday, February 9th, Green Mountain Cabaret Burlesque Variety Show, 8 p.m., Flynn Space, benefit the Flynn's Art Scholarship. Saturday, February 19th, is the 24th annual Winter is a Drag, <laughs> sponsored by the House of LeMay to benefit the People with AIDS Coalition. And there's an event at Positive Pie on February 22nd at 9.30. And it's part of the proceeds will go to benefit um, Stonewall 50 celebration. And I have no trivia question for this week, but Sunday the 27th was Holocaust Remembrance Day, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about it. I have some headlines. 
I got really a lot of care. headlines. I certainly do. I have very I have news from the gay penguin community. Aww. I've missed them. <laughs> well, they're back. All right. Uh, Angola decriminalizes same-sex conduct. I'm starting out with good news. Three billboards campaign targets gay conversion therapy in China. Now some less good news. Brazilian lawmaker steps down. Trans people must still be sterilized before changing gender in Japan. <coughs> Egypt sentences a TV host to jail over a gay interview. Then these are stories I may not get to, but then again I may. Um, Bali's LGBT pageant avoids the limelight amid public prejudice, but they are so these activists were crowned in secret. And I have a picture of them, and I'll return to that story perhaps. Kyrgyzstan man has gay carved into his stomach in a homophobic attack. And I have a very creepy picture of that. Uh, suspect arrested finally <coughs> over the murders of the Bangladesh LGBT activists. They were hacked to death in 2016 in their, the offices of the gay newspaper. I have a picture before you now of the murder victim, Hulhas Manan. Um, people have been arrested, no one has been charged. And finally, kind of an upbeat note, Stiletto races and hula hoops <laughs> at the Pride <laughs> Festival in Myanmar. So those are my headlines. Okay, that's the one for which I would want pictures. <laughs> I know, yeah. I couldn't get a picture. <laughs> <laughs> it was maddening. So, so that's your news. And yes. the penguins are going to be first. Penguins All are right. going to lead up the lineup. Damn. Well, there was um, sad news and late breaking news about Jesse Smollett, one of the stars of the TV series Empire. Mm, let's hear that. Supreme Court ruling on transgender people in the military. Arizona gives transgender employees less health care than their working partners. So Russell Tomey, a professor of the University of Arizona, has filed a class action suit. <coughs> South Dakota kills a bill that would have attacked transgender students. The HB 49 would have barred trans athletes for competing in school athletics. Florida LGBT community is going to civil war over non-discriminatory protections. Dallas venue refuses a gay couple and gets banned from major wedding planner website. Utah <coughs> bill blocks <coughs> gender changes on any birth certificates. South Bend Mayor Pete Buttigieg is running for the for uh, the nomination of um, uh, president, and he's gay, so that would be a first. Missouri, uh, a few weeks ago, reported about the two women, married women, uh, lesbians, who um, were trying to get into a senior uh, living arrangement, mm -hmm. and um, they went to court, and their suit was denied. Uh, I haven't heard whether they'll. Um, it was uh, a re appeal this or not, but the retirement community was a community of faith, as I recall. It was a community of faith. Okay. That religious um, freedom stuff. You know, I don't know if it was like, well, anyway, I think it was, but not like in that extreme kind of Catholic something or other. But anyway, San Francisco is starting an art center for LGBTQ people. This will be the first and will be the permanent home of the gay men's chorus. The choir uh, acquired the building, and they're establishing a center there in stages. So they're doing a few things now, and um, I think they're planning on buying a few other buildings, and they want to just do a big LGBTQ art center. So that's kind of exciting. One million moms go ballistic over Parents Magazine cover, which shows two gay dads. Um, and the right wing is losing it o over this. The Million <coughs> Moms organization says that these magazines are in doctor's offices <laughs> and all really? over the place where children might see them. 
The Southern Poverty Law Center characterizes the Million Moms organization as a hate group. Karen Pence, Ooh. the wife of Mike Pence, has taken a job at the Emanuel Christian School in Springfield, mm -hmm. Virginia. It is very clear that being LGBTQ is an abomination. In their contract, it says they must be born again Christians and must confirm that they believe that marriage is just between a man and a woman. Just one man, one woman? <coughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Bill to protect LGBTQ individuals for fair housing and employment fails in North Dakota, Senate vote by 20 to 27. And I have a few obituaries to read. Um, Diane Olson, Mary Oliver, and Kay Ballard. So we'll get to those later. And I'd like to add Dolores Knoll, if I may, okay. to your obituaries. Okay. A she's just at it tonight. Isn't she? She's, <laughs> and, you know, it's pertinent, it's I think. Fine. She's a groundbreaking academic. She taught at Kent State. She was the first person in 1972 to teach a course in LGBT studies. Huh. And what's interesting is that she died in a nursing home, and her partner was also in the nursing home. So it can happen. Yeah. But... And we'll ask about her influence when we interview the Professor Charles yeah. on our third anniversary. Well, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> if you've got questions and things you've always wanted to know. <laughs> about Anne. So, Beto Sanchez Perez. Now, people in, in the migrant workers community here in Vermont, this name is very familiar to them. This has been one of our leading LGBTQ activists within the migrant workers community. Um, he's openly gay man, has been working with the Pride Center to ensure that LGBTQ immigrants, migrant workers are adequately represented and get access to services. However, in December, he was stopped and ticketed for DUI. When he went to court, ICE was waiting for him as he exited the building and he was taken into custody. He had a hearing last week. It was extended until this Thursday, January 31st, at which point they will make a decision as to, you know, if he is going to be released, returned to the community here, or remain detained in New Hampshire and deported. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Migrant Justice is saying is, you know, this is not a felon. This is not a repeat offender. Why should Beto or any other of the migrant workers that have a catchphrase of milk with dignity, yeah. as part, which I love as part of their movement, and they have it in Spanish it, on their T-shirt, you know, why should they be treated any differently? You know, anyone who is picked up for DUI, a first offense, this is a protocol of what happens. Right. And it's not detention and it's not deportation. And that moves into <clears throat> the House Judiciary Committee had a public hearing about fair and impartial policing. There is no bill, but there will be follow-up committee hearings. And sitting in the room and listening to the testimony, what I heard repeatedly from law enforcement is they have model policies. They have gone out. 70 of the 75 law enforcement agencies in the state of Vermont have adopted them. But here's where they ran into a sort of bump in the road. The $40,000 that was supposed to have been appropriated for training was removed from last year's budget and people kind of missed that it wasn't there. So even though they had policies, they didn't have a means by which to train their officers on what those policies really meant. And what we heard from the NAACP, migrant workers, ACLU, is that Vermont law enforcement are sharing more information with immigration in ICE than I think people realize, more than with which we are truly comfortable. The ACLU in particular raised the question of, okay, this is how far Vermont has gone in saying we're going to set up policies where we don't ask you about immigration status. 
you know, we are not voluntarily working with the feds or with ICE. Is there more we could do? Are there other states that draw the line much further than we do? So that's one of the things that the Judiciary Committee is going to be looking at. But it, it was enlightening to hear, particularly there were my people who identified as migrant workers who were testifying, who talked about they're afraid to even call an ambulance when their daughter is having yeah. an asthma attack because they're afraid that the police will show up as well. And unfortunately, these farming communities are in rural areas in Vermont where it's the county sheriff and not necessarily the state police who have had more training who are responding. And the worst incident that was relayed where it was the county sheriff who radioed saying, I need someone to help interpret from Spanish. And it was Border Patrol and ICE that heard the call and said, oh, oh we can come help. Uh. And then they stepped in and did what ICE does. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so now, mm. you, now you're going to enter, and, and I'll come back with some legislative stuff, more legislative stuff, but you're going to talk to me about penguins. That makes me smile. Yeah. Well, I'm going to show you penguins. I'm, are you, well, let me show you a clip now of baby Svenjik, <laughs> and I'll remind you about them. Actually, it's a she. Um, having a swimming lesson. So this is a minute clip. You see the um, one of the workers at Sydney Sea Life Aquarium in Australia conducting a swimming lesson. So. stage not but I have another picture oh, okay. of the original diving lesson uh, <laughs> that I'll show you now but let us recall S baby Svenjik um, in Australia um, that this chick was born in October to um, two gay parents these are Gen 2 penguins um, who became inseparable last year right before breeding season. Visitors often spotted the pair waddling around and going for swims together, which is why they were deemed to be suitable prospective parents. Now you may recall that I mentioned in October when another penguin couple laid two eggs, Benjik, and their names are, these two male penguins are named Sven and Magic. So the couple has been called Svenjik. So Svenjik um, was entrusted with a, to hatch a backup egg because it's common in Gen 2 penguin um, culture to lay two eggs each breeding season. And for the sub-Antarctic penguins, um, whom we are considering tonight, um, they usually only have enough resources to incubate and raise a single egg. So the backup chick may not survive. Not in this case, however. On October 19th, 2018, an adorable 91 gram penguin chick <laughs> was born to the doting penguin parents. Didn't we have a picture at the time? <laughs> yes, we did. And, but now we have more pictures. Now I have showing before you a picture of baby Svenjik being taught to dive by her parents. And at the end of the last, the clip I showed you, the uh, zookeeper teased us with the gender 
of baby Svenjik, and that has been revealed. But let me continue with the story. It's important for the keepers at the aquarium to know the gender of each penguin for population management. This is uh, the zookeeper Hannon, who also appears in the clip. It takes experts a couple of months and a blood test to determine the gender of a penguin, as the sexes closely resemble one another. But peng in the penguin world, gender roles aren't defined, and parents shall share equal responsibilities when it comes to maintaining nests and raising the young. Now, baby Svenjik is three months old. <laughs> and I have a picture now before you of the family. Magic, Sven, and baby Svenjik. So we've seen the clip of the swimming lessons, and we've seen the picture of the diving lesson by the parent. So, turns out that baby Svenjik also has a healthy appetite. It was, she was born at just 91 grams, which I said, which is less than an apple. And now she weighs over five kilograms, which is the size of a watermelon. <laughs> so she clearly loves food, the zookeeper says. Baby Svenjik will be an ambassador for the species who are facing global threats such as global warning, warming and plastic pollution. Uh. And uh, we look forward to sharing more updates with you in the coming months, says Hannon at Sea Life. I thought you were going to say, says and of all things LGBTQ. <laughs> well, you can count on that also. <laughs> we'll trace the growth and development of baby Svenjik. And they keep saying they're going to change baby Svenjik's name, but they haven't. Okay, more good news. Uh, Angola decriminalizes same-sex conduct. It's finally shed the divisive uh, vices against nature provision in its law, widely interpreted to be a ban on homosexual conduct. Taking things one step further, the government has also prohibited discrimination against people on the basis of sexual orientation. And so anyone refusing to employ or provide services to individuals based on their sexual orientation may face up to two years in prison. This is a great stride. The changes came on January 23rd as Angola's parliament adopted its first new penal code since it gained independence from Portugal in 1975 and removed the provision inherited from its Portuguese colonizers. There are a lot of these colonial um, draconian laws that stay on the books. While there have been no known prosecutions under the law, Iris Angola, the country's only gay rights lobby group, has often complained that its members face discrimination when accessing health care and education. Now, this is another good thing that happened. Last year, Angola gave legal status to Iris Angola, which was established in 2013 a move that can now be seen as the forerunner for this last step toward equality. The group called the decision an historic moment, allowing the organization to defend the rights of sexual minorities in Angola. In contrast, Mozambique, another former Portuguese colony, decriminalized homosexuality in 2015 when it too adopted a new penal code but declined to register the country's largest LGBT group, Lambda, leaving it to operate freely, but not legally. And casting aside this archaic and insidious relic of the colonial past, Angola has eschewed discrimination and embraced equality. The 69 other countries around the world that still criminalize consensual, consensual same-sex conduct should follow its lead. Now I have more, or I can move to Linda. <laughs> Let me do one well, more story. All here, right, go ahead. If I may. <laughs> we recall that movie, um, three billboards uh, outside Ebbing, Missouri. Yeah. And that has influenced some Chinese allies to launch a campaign against gay conversion therapy. 
a Chinese artist and a gay police officer have launched an unusually <laughs> public bold protest campaign in which bright red trucks bearing slogans denouncing homosexual conversion therapy are being paraded <laughs> through several major cities. Now I have a picture of the trucks, the three <laughs> trucks in particular. Artist Wu Gong um, said three billboards, the movie, was about raising and questioning unresolved issues. We want to use this format to raise doubts about conversion therapy, he said. He's 28. Wu, who is based in the southern city of Shenzhen, says he is not gay, and his police officer associate, identified only by his surname Lin, planned to stage the campaign in eight cities. It began last weekend huh? in Shanghai. China removed homosexuality and bisexuality from a, an official list of mental illnesses in 2001, but official terminology still includes vague references to sexual orientation disorders. Some parents, as we know, as we may surmise, are known to pressure gay children to correct their orientation, including through conversion therapy. I thought that was a Christian thing. I guess it isn't. Huh? No. The trucks bear slogan saying that therapy was being abused for, was being abused for a non-existent disease. Others say Chinese clarification of mental disorders still includes sexual orientation disor disorder. It's been 19 years. Why? Such campaigns are rare in China, where authorities quickly shut down most public protests to prevent them from snowballing. But Wu said the project has encountered no obstructions yet. Its Chinese social media account remains unblocked by censors and had six million followers as of Wednesday. Wu said the project has raised 3,000 US dollars in donations. He hopes to raise triple that to pay for drivers and fuel. Our ultimate goal is for more people to talk about this, said Wu. We stopped near a shopping mall in Nanjing <laughs> and a security guard came out to ask what sexual orientation disorder meant. After we explained it to him, he supported us. <laughs> Good so that's an interesting kind yeah. of Yeah, maybe we should story. try some of that. Yeah, we could get a truck and drive around. Yeah, we could go to St. Louis and Atlanta. Atlanta. Atlanta, mm -hmm. Dallas, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Birmingham. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, a sad bit of news today, Empire star Jesse Smollett was hospitalized in a possible hate crime. Police say that the 36-year-old was in Chicago walking around when someone shouted racial and homophobic slurs at him. I read he was leaving a restaurant. Really? Mm -hmm. At 5 a.m.? No, it, it didn't say five minutes. Uh, it said it okay. was, I read the Hollywood Reporter version. Well, there you go. <laughs> well, I heard he was just walking around. <laughs> well, it, it just happened this uh, today. morning in the yeah. early hours, I guess. Two men attacked him. They poured some chemical liquid on his body. And um, they wrapped a rope around his neck. He is openly gay and first came out in 2015 on the Ellen Show. The police at the time, at this time, have not taken any, they have no suspects, and um, they're still looking at cameras and things around the area that might give some indication. But weren't they <coughs> yelling racial and homophobic slurs? That's what yeah. I said. Yeah. Oh, did you say? I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you better pay attention. Sorry, I have a cold. Unfortunately, um, the Supreme Court allows Trump administration's trans military police uh, policy to go into effect. The Supreme Court Tuesday allowed the Trump administration to begin enforcing its policy limiting, <coughs> limiting trans people from being in the military, their ability to serve, while broader legal battles play out in the lower courts. The five to four, four decision allows the Pentagon to buy new recruits <coughs> uh, from going through transition. Uh, the 
Pentagon officials insist that their policy is not a ban. <coughs> Excuse me, but the rules need are needed to prevent disruption, disruption in training, and unit co cohesion. cohesion. The Trump administration will make the same arguments as the cases are fought one by one up to the Supreme Court. This is a blow to the trans community who now may be forced to leave and might face stigmatization. The justices divided along ideological lines and neither side explained its decision. But the arguments have been playing out in the courtroom across America. LGBT advocates expect that many of the other cases waiting to reach the Supreme Court will also fail. Recruits will be allowed to join if they are deemed clinical, clinically stable in their preferred sex for 18 months and did not suffer from marked stress. It seems like if you're in a really stressful situation like this, you would have stress. Stress. Um, and also uh, having to do with the Trump administration, they've been helping faith-based agencies block LGBTQ adoption. The administration gave those anti-LGBT efforts a boost by granting a request from the governor of South Carolina to allow federally funded child welfare agencies to turn LGBTQ people away based on their religious beliefs. Governor Henry McMaster asked the Department of Health and Human Resources to exempt the state's faith-based child welfare agencies from Obama-era non-discriminatory regulations protecting LGBTQ couples. This is, of course, granting exemption to fund these agencies with our taxpayers' dollars to discriminate. Did it <coughs> not also extend to single mothers and the Jewish community? I'm not sure. That was one of the commentaries that I had read. Hmm. Is that that would be it the could be. that would be the practical implication for what they had allowed? Yeah. So, okay. It's so you don't keep coughing. I. <laughs> Oh, I'm enjoying you and so, coffee. Yeah. She has a cold and she's desperately trying not to share it. Really? It's too late for me, I'm afraid. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> we digress. As I move <laughs> further to the right. <laughs> the Centers for Disease Control just released a report <coughs> that has the first most comprehensive reporting on transgender high school students. And what they found is that two, that. That two that percent too of the students polled identify as transgender, which is much higher than what people had guessed. However, 35% of them had made a suicide attempt. 27% yeah. felt unsafe going to and from <coughs> school, and 35% reported having been bullied at school. So, and I think that some of that reflects the, the data that we get from the Department of Health Youth Risk Survey here in Vermont, but. May I so add? I, I, and I'm sure you read this also, that the suicide, suicide attempts have diminished in schools that have GSAs. GSAs, yes. USAs. Well, so and that, that gets into part of our legislative report with the Ethnic and Social Studies Standards Curriculum, where those schools were as included into the curriculum, not as a standalone, but truly embedded into the curriculum all of that sort of bullying starts leveling out. There I know, because they said even with straight people, straight people had less suicide with an ASA exactly. in that school. GSA or yeah. USA? Well, there was yeah. also a study that said people are happier if they have a gay friend. Seriously, did you see it? it? No, it? but I believe it. There was it. a study that said that. But. <laughs> okay, so looking very quickly at the legislation going through, one of the things we're going to be following is the minimum wage bill and what is being proposed in the Senate Economic Development Committee is $15 per hour by 2024. And that would actually give people a boost and looking at you know, the graph, it would really be advantageous. Paid family leave bill just got introduced. It would 
do a, and as Becca Balance had said on the last show, the burden to an employee would be one and a half cents per pay period. Seems nominal. But what you would get is 12 weeks of paid family leave per year. What Phil Scott and Governor Sununu are proposing with their voluntary process right. would only be six weeks. So there's, there's a radical difference. One of my concerns, and I will be submitting this as a piece of written testimony, is that this is based on a relationship status and a documented relationship status. So if you are a domestic partner, you still may not be entitled to benefits. Oh. So, and I'm going to leave that for now so I can come back and spend more time with the Holocaust overview. Well, I have several items to discuss involving the sorry situation in Brazil. Let's go um, back to the penguins. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Jair Bolsonaro, as you know, was elected the uh, gentleman. Supposedly. Mm -hmm, exactly, <laughs> who said that he'd rather his son be dead than be gay. Um, we also recall the horrible, tragic assassination of Mariela Franco in Brazil. Didn't uh, they arrest some police officers or something, I thought? Well, what happened in this, the story that I'm getting to, is that Mo Bolsonaro's son uh, has brought into the staff somebody, uh, the police officer who was accused of killing her. Right. And so um, that has prompted the current, um, the second openly gay congressman, um, Gene Wheelies, to resign. Not only resign, but leave the country. I have a picture of him before you. He said on Thursday he won't serve the new term for which he was reelected due to death threats uh, and yeah. that he now plans to live abroad. Uh, he belongs to the Socialism and Liberty Party. Uh, his seat in Brasilia will go to a substitute lawmaker who is also gay, huh? Rio Councilman David Miranda, who is the husband of Pulitzer Prize winning J U.S. journalist Glenn Greenwald. Huh. In a letter to the party explaining his decision to leave Brazil, he said that death threats had made his life unbearable, that he hardly left his real home, his siblings and his mother had also been threatened. Uh, he said in a newspaper interview that the climate of violence in Brazil, which had one of the world's highest murder rates last year, had worsened since the October election of the far-right president, Jair Bolsonaro, who has disparaged, disparaged gays and other minorities. He said he was tired of living with bodyguards since the execution-style murder last year of popular Rio de Janeiro con Councilwoman Mariela Franco. It was not Bolsonaro's election itself, it was the level of violence that has increased since he was elected, he told, uh, Wheelies told the Folha de Sao Paulo newspaper. I don't want to sacrifice myself, he told the paper. I want to take care of myself and stay alive. Wheelie's 44, and again, I have a picture to show you of him, was a staunch advocate for gay rights and fought religious discrimination and violence against women during, during his two terms in Congress. Brazil's first openly gay congressman was fashion designer and television presenter Clodeville Hernandez, who represented Sao, Sao Paulo for two years in Brasilia and died of a stroke in 2009. Unlike Wheelies, however, he did not publicly defend the LGBT cause. Mm. So it's terrible in Brazil. Okay, let's move to more bad news from Japan. Um, <laughs> You're just an upper tonight. <laughs> you know? This is my, the down portion yeah. of my reporting. It has upheld a law effectively requiring trans people to legally change their gender to be sterilized. Tak read that. Yeah. Takatuo Yasui, a transgender man who wants to change 
the gender instead on his, listed on his official documents, had appealed to the court seeking to overlaw, over, overturn Law 111, which requires applicants to permanently lack functioning reproductive parts to qualify for gender aff affirmation. That's a little different than being sterile. That's, that's going more into the you must be castrated before. Really? You know how long the sterilized castrated? No, they're different things. Over dinner, we will have this discussion. Yeah, we'll sort it out. Um, the Supreme Court unanimously rejected his case Thursday, ruling that the 2003 law was constitutional, though judges added it was invasive and encouraged the legislature to review it. The court initially said the law was intended, this is a, their bogus reasoning, the court initially said that the law was intended to prevent problems in parent-child relations, which could lead to societal confusion and avoid abrupt changes to society. Um, Suki Chung, Asia Pacific campaign manager at Amnesty International said the ruling was a blow for the recognition of transgender people in Japan. It, it is a missed opportunity to address the discrimination transgender people face. Conservative, we recall this, I reported on it at the time, conservative Japanese lawmaker Mio Sujita uh, belongs to the ruling Democratic Party. Um, and we recall she attracted widespread criticism last year when she published an article saying support for LGBTs has gone too far. Will people agree to have their taxes used on LGBT couples? They cannot have children, so they are unproductive, she said, <laughs> according to the Japan Times. However, despite all this evidence, Polls suggest that Japan is be becoming less conservative on LGBT issues. A poll this month by an advertising term firm found more respondents than ever openly identified as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Over 70% of respondents to this poll said they supported stronger legal protections for LGBT people. How many? Encouraging. 70%, wow. according to this poll. But it seems like the ruling party is against it. We're now, we know with that. I was going to say, we, we know what that's like. <laughs> no, no kidding. No kidding. So let's go to bad news from Egypt, if we can. Uh, Egypt sentences a TV host to jail over a gay interview. You know, and we have friends who just invited us to travel to Egypt with them. We declined don't, don't the do offer. It. Don't do it. An Egyptian court on Sunday sentenced a television host to one year in prison for interviewing a gay man last year, a judicial source said. Mohammed al Getty, who has expressed his stance against homosexuality on several occasions, was accused of promoting homosexuality in contempt of religion. The misdemeanor court in Giza yeah, also fined him three fined him three hundred sorry, 3,000 Egyptian pounds, which is $147, and ordered to he be put under surveillance for one year after serving his sentence, says the lawyer who brought the case against him. In August 2018, Getty hosted a gay man on his talk show on the private LTC TV station and discussed homosexuality on the air. During the interview, the gay man whose face was blurred to hide his identity, said he was a sex worker, and he openly talked about his relationship with another man. After the interview was aired, the Supreme Council for Media Regulation, <coughs> Egypt's top, top media body, suspended the channel for two weeks for professional violations. Um, in a statement at the time, it said LCTC TV had violated uh, its decision that bans the appearance of homosexuals or the promotion of their slogans. The council banned the appearance of homosexuals on any outlet, and I remember this incident. After a rainbow flag, which we know is symbolic, what it's symbolic of, 
was waived during a Cairo concert in 2017. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. At the time, the authorities launched a large-scale crackdown on suspected homosexuals, triggering con condemnation from right groups. Homosexuality is not expressly outlawed in Egypt, but gays have previously been charged with debauchery in the deeply conservative Muslim society. Whoa. So I would caution my friends who are gay men to maybe avoid Egypt, but it's up to them. I know. I have more things to talk about, but we can move on if you'd I like. I think we need to move on. All right. <laughs> That's fine. I'll go ahead to talk <coughs> about Bali. <laughs> maybe but you'll have time later. Okay. We'll see. All right. Diane Olson dies at 65. Diane was a marriage equality activist, died of a brain tumor in her home in L.A. She was married to Robin Tyler, who was a comedian and he was a writer comedian. and et cetera. The couple had been together for 25 years. This is the interesting thing. I didn't know this, but beginning in 2001, Diane and Robin would go to court on Valentine's Day and apply for a marriage license. And of course they were. <laughs> Denied. Uh, denied, but they went every year on Valentine's Day mm. and asked for a marriage license. <laughs> Mary Oliver dies at 83. Her partner was Molly Cook and was referred to as M in many of Oliver's poetry. She received a Pulitzer Prize in 1984 for her collection, American Primitive. And Kay Ballard, which I guess she was kind of closeted, um, really? Yes. <laughs> Did you ever see her? Yes. Okay. But according to sources, she was rather closeted and didn't really want to talk about lesbians okay. or anything like that. But she was a comic actress and singer. And her, uh, she began her career in vaudeville. So. May I add the dish <coughs> we got from Andy Helm on Gay yeah. USA? Apparently there was a gathering in a lesbian bar and Liz Smith, the columnist, mm -hmm. yeah. took mm -hmm. Gay Ballard's girlfriend. Ooh. <laughs> I know, I know. Andy is getting really trashy. Well, he gets around. <laughs> Andy's getting really trashy. <laughs> I know that's a good little tidbit. I forgot about that. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's it for me. So. Sunday was Holocaust Remembrance Day. And the reason, the reason I'm really obsessing on it is if you look at Berlin in the 1920s and you look at what we enjoy now, you know, the freedom of our relationships, holding hands in public, that sense of acceptance and really not needing to hide, that's what Berlin was like in the 1920s. And then by 1933, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, that's a mouthful, came into power. Yeah. And they came into power on this nationalist <coughs> agenda. Sound familiar? Hmm. And a piece of that nationalist agenda was dealing with all those perverts and how they had taken over the German culture, the German society, basically erasing them. Sound familiar? And the German Penal Code was paragraph 175, which we referenced at varying points in time. The estimate is that prior to the rise of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, also known as, oh my, the Nazis, um, there was an estimate that there were probably a million gay men in Germany. Yeah. Between 1933 and 1945, they arrested over 100,000, 50,000 were put into concentration camps, and the estimate was that 60% of those people who were incarcerated never survived. And it was because they were on the bottom of the hierarchy. There was this concept of working to death. You move the pile of rocks from here to there and then back again, and were deliberately fed less than what they knew you would need to survive. They were also subjected to experimentation. And I'm not going to go into a whole lot of details, but you can imagine it's where castration comes from. And when you talked about sterilization, 
you know, there's a difference between a vasectomy and castration, and we can thank these people for that. They also employed their own degree of conversion therapy. <laughs> One of the pieces about the Holocaust that doesn't get a lot of recognition is that lesbians were interned in the concentration camps, but at a much smaller percentage because the German culture was very misogynist, male-based, women really didn't have rights or recognition within the culture, and the lesbians who were interned, it was because they were antisocial. They would not submit to a man's dominance. Mm. You were going against the social order. As people may know that what the Nazis used to identify a gay man in the concentration camp was a pink triangle. They used a black your triangle. Collar. Which I wear repeatedly now since the election in 2016, every day. And lesbians, anti those antisocial women, <laughs> I have greater respect for you now, were given black triangles. And one of the things they did to, to try and experiment with conversion therapy is once a week, the lesbians who were put into the brothel had to have sex with the gay men. Uh. So mm. it. And when people look at the history about the Holocaust and how we were impacted by it, there's not really a whole lot of information because at the end of World War II, we were still considered to be criminals. And there is a story that was shared at one of our anti-discrimination hearings that when the Allied forces were liberating the concentration camps and as they were helping people out, they were asking what all of the different symbols on um, their, their uniforms meant. And when they were told the pink triangle meant that the person was a homosexual, the Allied forces took him back inside the concentration camp and left him there. Oh. There wasn't even an acknowledgement until the 1980s that we may have been interned and that they may have documentations from those hearings where people were you know, charged with the crime of homosexuality. It wasn't until 2002 that the German government finally apologized for the persecution of homosexuality during the Holocaust. And it wasn't until 2005 that the European Parliament included a recognition that the persecution of homosexuals as part of the resolution relating to the Holocaust. Huh. So we, we, the impact that it has on us, you know, doesn't get discussed. I'm, I'm concerned because there are members of our youth who can recognize a rainbow flag, but don't recognize the significance of a pink triangle. You look about to try and say something. Yes, I'm not surprised by that because when Linda and I in the 90s we were in Germany traveled to Germany and went to Dachau, they had a, a like what a ribbon. was it? In the 90s, yeah. um, there was a ribbon of all the symbols, the Star of David and but so forth. But it wasn't there. And they wouldn't include the pink triangle. The person who showed us through acknowledged it, but he said, you know, this is under dispute. They won't, they won't include this symbol. They it wasn't until the 80s they that yeah. they began to acknowledge official German government response wasn't until 2002. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. The, the other story relative to World War II, and I was sharing it with, with people in my office today, Netherlands. You know, th there was a tradition, and people who have seen me wandering the streets of Montpellier may be able to pick me out. And, and one of the stories is that on Fridays, and the other story was, you know, it was all the time, they wore a red beret as a symbol of the resistance. <laughs> there was this oppressive regime that was in charge. They were, it was futile to try and resist them, but this was their symbol, much as <laughs> yeah. of saying, we are not one with, we are not a part of. And if I may add one more thing, I'd recommend to our audience Martin Sherman's play Bench, which has been made yes. into a movie, yeah. which evokes that whole. Era. That was the 90s too, wasn't it? Written Bench? in the 90s? Yeah, I believe so. 
I think it was. I think we saw the play in the 90s, didn't we? I don't know. I'll double check that. In your youth. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, the, and again, is, is part of my concern is that we have parts of our history that we've been trying to bring out with the trivia questions and, and acknowledgement of different events. But, and it's really looking at that ethnics and social curriculum standard is yeah. embedding all of the underrepresented communities into that curriculum so that when you are teaching about the Holocaust, all of the people who were persecuted and incarcerated in turn become part of that conversation. It is no longer an other, it's part of an inclusive, this happened to us. Bent was 1979. Wow. So we saw it in Boston. Yeah, we did, but we saw it must have saw it in the early it's 80s. It's been made a movie, too. Yeah, it has. Yeah. Well, being at Dachau was one of the saddest experiences of horrible. my entire, I mean, really, it was. It's really life changing. Just to stand there was unbelievable. So, on that cheery note. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we, we thank you for spending this time with us. And Come back remember, in, in these times, we must always, in all times, oh, absolutely. resist. resist.